This is 5 Minute Friday on subword tokenization with byte pair encoding. When working with written natural language data, as we do with many natural language processing models, a step we typically carry out while pre-processing the data is tokenization. In a nutshell, tokenization is the conversion of a long string of characters into smaller units that we call tokens. The standard way to tokenize natural language is historically something called word-level tokenization. This is a conceptually straightforward kind of tokenization. We can, for example, simply use the white space between words to identify where one word ends and the next word begins, thereby converting a natural language string like the cat sat into three tokens, the and cat and sat. This word-level tokenization is used by techniques like word-to-vec and glove, two popular NLP techniques for quantitatively representing the relative meaning of words. A big drawback with such word-level tokenization is that if a word didn't show up enough times in our training data, then when the NLP model encounters that word in production, there's no way to handle it. In situations like this, we consider the new token to be unknown, and therefore it is ignored by the model, even though the word might have been important to our production NLP application. To avoid the big unknown token issue that word level tokenization has, we can use something called character level tokenization instead. With character level tokenization, a natural language string like the cat sat is converted now into 11 tokens instead of three. So it's just each of the characters in the sentence the cat sat. So T H E space C A T space S A T. All of those characters, including the spaces, are included in the tokenization. So this way now, when we encounter a word outside of our model's vocabulary in production, we don't need to ignore that word. Instead, the model can leverage its aggregate representation of the characters that make up the new word to represent the new word. A technique called ELMO, which stands for Embeddings from Language Model, is a prominent example of an NLP technique that uses character level tokenization. Unfortunately, character level tokenization also has its own drawbacks. For one, it requires a large number of tokens to represent a sequence of text. In addition, unlike a word, a character doesn't on its own convey any meaning, which can result in suboptimal model performance. So we've now learned that both word level and character level tokenization have critical flaws. What can we do? Well, thankfully, NLP researchers have devised a solution, something called subword tokenization. So subwords sit between words and characters. They aren't as coarse as words, but they aren't as meaningless or small as characters. So subword tokenization blends the computational efficiency of word level tokens with the capacity for character level tokenization to handle the out of vocabulary words. This ends up being the best of both worlds. There are many algorithms out there for tokenizing strings of natural language into subwords, many of which rely upon a concept called byte pair encoding. The general idea is that we specify how many subwords we'd like to have in our vocabulary, and then we rely on byte pair encoding to predict what the particular subwords should be given the natural language we provide to it. So there's a four step process here. The first involves the algorithm, the byte pair encoding algorithm performing word level tokenization. Second, it splits each individual word level token into granular character level tokens. Third, it computes how frequently character level tokens occur next to each other across all of the words in our natural language data. And then finally, it merges together the most frequently occurring adjacent characters until the number of subwords you specified to compute is reached. Once computed in this way, the beauty of subwords is that unlike characters, subwords do have meaning, and so they can be recombined to represent out of vocabulary words efficiently. For example, Let's say that after we ran byte pair encoding over our natural language data, it learned to represent the subword tokens re, lat, and ed. These three subwords, re, lat, and ed, can be combined to form the word related. Now, in a contrived example to demonstrate the power of this technique, let's say that the word unrelated wasn't in our training data. When our NLP application comes across the word unrelated in production, it should nevertheless be able to efficiently represent the meaning of the word unrelated because not only did the byte pair encoding tokenize re, lat, and ed, but let's assume that it also tokenized the subword un as well. 
Thus, the subword un and its negation of meaning would allow our NLP application to represent that unrelated means the opposite of related, even though it never encountered the word unrelated during training. Very cool and very powerful. The upshot is that byte pair encoding is indeed so powerful that it is a crucial component behind many of the leading NLP models of today, such as BERT, GPT-3, and ExcelNet. So, if you didn't understand the broad strokes of tokenization, particularly this influential byte pair encoding approach to tokenization prior to today's episode, hopefully you do now. Thanks to Sean Kosla, a data scientist on my team at my machine learning company, Nebula, for inspiring this 5-Minute Friday episode by writing about tokenization with byte pair encoding in his Let's Talk Text Substack newsletter. He uses the newsletter to provide a weekly, easy-to-read summary of a recent key natural language processing paper or concept, and so you can subscribe to that for free if that's something you're interested in. We've provided a link to Sean's Substack in the show notes. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Until next time, keep on rocking it out there, folks, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science Podcast with you very soon.